This took place over a few years in a farmhouse in the desert of Arizona. It was newly developed land. We moved into the place when I was 15. At the time, I was going through a lot emotionally and smoking a lot of weed. That might explain some of my personal experiences, so I'll try not to dwell on them too much. The house was set up almost plantation style. It was very wide and narrow, a big wraparound porch and lots of awkward corners. The front room was a tall library with an open balcony to the upstairs, which ran into long skinny bedrooms. My parents' room was closest to the stairs and attached to a nursery with a sliding ensuite door. My brothers, two years younger, and my room were at the end of a dark hallway. That side of the house never got sun, so it was bad vibes all round. Downstairs, there was a fucked up Harry Potter style closet, a sunken living room, a kitchen in the centre of the house, and a sunken playroom for the baby. It honestly started the first day we moved in. My brother and I were the only ones in the house, unboxing plates. The place was so empty, everything echoed. I swear, it sounded like a little girl laughed, like a creepy track you could get off an app or something. Keep in mind, the TVs were not plugged in. We were on an acre of land far away from the dirt road, and my brother was way too stupid to pull a prank like that. I started hearing voices at night. This wasn't unusual. I honestly used to freak myself out so badly, I think I made up noises to scare myself. My parents had raised me not to talk about things scaring me, to tough it out and be a big girl. It was fine most of the time during the day. Everything came at night. I remember distinctly when it started messing with me in bed. In solidarity, my brother and I kept our bedroom doors open for the hallway's nightlight, and in case we needed to call for each other. We had a pretty fucked up childhood that might have contributed to all the codependency I'll describe during this. I was falling asleep, but not quite out. I felt the blanket slipping off the bed and reached down to grab it. This was common. I didn't have a bed frame with a foot. It kept slipping no matter how I tried to tuck it. In classic horror movie fashion, the last time I pulled it, I felt tension. There was nothing it could have been caught on. I feel like the second I went from confused to terrified, it bounced back to me. I don't know how to explain this well, but I was sure someone was under the bed pulling it from me. Later, I moved another nightlight into the bedroom. It was a kind of spooky amber orange and I convinced my parents to let me paint the walls cherry red. Again, I was almost asleep, but not quite asleep, so I don't think it could have been sleep paralysis. I heard the carpet rustle and maybe joints cracking. It sounded like my mom had come to check on me. I opened my eyes and immediately froze. I don't think I've ever been more scared in my life. There was a woman crawling across my floor, from the far side of my room to the foot of my bed. She was pale and stringy haired like she was going bald. I couldn't see her face. I don't know how I fell asleep. I couldn't scream or move. I think she disappeared under my bed. Again, this could be her hallucination. My baby brother was about seven months old when she started coming out during the day. My mum was a teacher at the time and was able to stay home with us during summer vacation. It was lunchtime. We were watching a movie quietly downstairs while the baby napped. There were noises upstairs like something dropped to the ground. We listened for a second before my mum ran up. She thought the baby had fallen out of his crib. We opened the door and found him asleep. There was some weird shit on the floor. It took us a while to figure out it was drywall or something. There was a crawl space to, to a small attic where the AC and insulation could be reached. It was barely big enough to get into, a good nine feet from the ground. It also had to be pushed up and slid over to open. There was a visible gap. The carpet was a really ugly dark blue, so we could see white fucking spots on the ground like something was dragged from one side of the room to where the crib was. It stopped right in front of it. My mom checked the closet and called my stepdad. He couldn't leave work, so we stayed downstairs until he got home and checked the crawl space. We, we have never had animals. It's really difficult for most things to live in Arizona, so wildlife is pretty rare in that area. He didn't find anything or signs of anything living up there. 
This happened every day for two weeks. We really didn't know what to make of it. My mum thought it would be the AC suctioning the opening up. It stopped and didn't happen again for two and a half years when my baby sister was born and stayed in the same crib. Again, it happened on and off for a few weeks and never again. The AC never popped the opening open again. To keep my own solo experiences brief, I had a period of three months where I straight up didn't sleep. I went crazy. Every night, I felt like my bed was shaking. The instant I laid my head dead, it would vibrate. The metal frame would sway. I'd feel like someone was pushing the mattress between the baseboards or sitting on the corner. I had my brother touch the frame one night to tell me if the shaking was in my head or not. He said it wasn't, but I'm not sure if he was just playing into it. I thought I might be having seizures or something. At one point, I got so frustrated I started sleeping on the couch downstairs with the dog. I started hearing whispers too. Not a noise that sounded odd, but someone calling my name. My name has three fucking syllables. I would be in my room, door open, doing something at night after my parents went to bed. It was a female voice, but it sounded off. I don't know how to explain it. The downstairs really scared me after the lights went out, so I never went down, but I did walk to the balcony to look down. I never saw anything, but the whispering would stop when I got close. My brother started hearing it too. He's kind of weird. His life stream has been enlisting in the army, so his reaction was always getting his knife and walking right downstairs to confront it. He'd turn on the lights and look around before coming back up. He slept on my floor a few nights because he was convinced she wanted me. We had prior haunting experiences, which led to my parents making jokes that the ghosts follow us. They didn't pay much attention to it at this time when it was quiet. One night, my parents went out with the babies. My brother and I were in our rooms, doors open per usual. We started hearing something weird. I thought it was the wind. It got louder until it was clear a woman was fucking wailing. I know it sounds crazy, but it was so clear. We hid in my room for what felt like hours calling my mom. For some reason, it didn't occur to us to call the police. The crying stopped. We had to plan to run for the stairs and out the nearest door. All of the lights were on in the house and my brother had his stupid knives. It's like it knew we were going to leave. We heard shuffling outside the door and maybe breathing. It could have been the air conditioning. We kind of decided that we were ready to die, unlocked the door and booked it. The crying started again and it was clear it was in my parents' room. We stood outside the property line for an hour, waiting for them to come home, watching the house. No one could have gotten out without us seeing. We had huge windows lining the upstairs hallway that showed everything with the lights on. My parents made fun of us and still do about that night. A few other incidents include my baby brother talking to the man upstairs. He'd stand in front of the balcony and talk up to someone. He told us the man was hiding in my room. He talked about the man in the window and would ask, who's that? Direct to the doors at night. I don't want to talk about all of it, but there were so many instances of voices, doors slamming, and things being knocked over in my room. I thought I was losing my mind. I moved out at 18 and come back occasionally, usually to babysit. Apparently, my reluctant believer mother and absolute skeptic stepdad watched a coffee pot jump off the counter. They also were sitting outside having a fire open evening when they saw a figure in the balcony window of their bedroom. It was a tall man, but my stepdad still needed urging to go upstairs. It appeared a second time, closer to where the nursery door was. My mom said she had horrible dreams about a man in the corner of her room after that. She was present for many of the times we heard footsteps upstairs, door slamming when the AC was off, etc. But she always denied there being anything wrong. My parents left town with the kids for a week. At this point I was 19 and happily living an hour away. My mom begged me to check on my brother and stay a few nights for the weekend. I arrived during the evening after I got off of work. I asked how it had been alone. He said he was fine, he just didn't go upstairs at night and minded his business. He said if he ignored it and tried not to get scared, then it ignored him. He felt safe with the dog. 
We were watching YouTube and eating when we started to hear a deep noise. At first I thought it was a bike or one of the small buggies people drove out there. And I noticed it was holding a tune. It was humming. The dog had a weird thing about staring into the bathroom if the door was open, which was scary at night. This time, the door was closed and he still stood up and stared. The noise was so deep it sounded like it couldn't be human, but it was definitely melodic. There's nothing I could figure out to explain it. My brother and I just kind of looked at each other. Then a door slammed upstairs and we decided to fuck off and go on a walk. When we got back, I decided I would sleep in my parents' room. It didn't feel right to stay in the kids' room, but looking back, it would have been best to stay close to my brother. I fell asleep surprisingly easy. I guess about two hours passed before my brother slammed the door open. The house smelled like it was burning. Not really like a fire smell, but like a burning plastic and trash. I was panicked. I was the adult and didn't know what to do. We checked the house. I turned off the air conditioning thinking it might be on fire. We opened all the windows and fell asleep on the couches downstairs. The next day, the smell was still lingering, but less overwhelming. The air conditioner was fine when I turned it back on. Like usual, the day was fine. The next night, my brother and I went on a jack-in-the-box run. It might have been taken 30 minutes. We arrived home to a mess of blood, vomit and shit. The dog was sick all over the living room. We immediately took him to an emergency vet, certain he was dying. They checked him for everything they could and gave him a clean bill. When we got home, all hell broke loose. My brother and I were cleaning up the mess with the doors open for airflow. There was absolutely insane banging noises from upstairs. We hadn't locked up on the way out. My brother thought someone had snuck in and was trashing the upstairs. We went up to check and I hung downstairs ready to call the police. Nothing happened. Nothing even seemed out of place. We kept cleaning, but the noises started almost immediately. It kind of sounded like someone was shouting behind a wall of cement. I couldn't tell the gender. My brother told me he had been fine until I got there. I could leave if I wanted. I totally did. I didn't go back. My parents sold the house this year. During the interim of the move, they stayed in an Airbnb. My brother lived really close to his work, so he stayed in the house with the dog for a few weeks. This story is just his own, so I'm still not sure if I believe it. He's kind of weird, but not one to embellish. He had been hearing the usual things, even his name being called in the night, but he ignored it all. His friends had been coming over to sleep, keep him company. The last day he was supposed to finish moving, he brought a friend. He says he felt they were being watched the whole time they cleared the place out, and his friend left him to lock up. They got into the car facing the house when they noticed the blinds were open. They were definitely closed on the way out. His friend claims he saw them open from the side of his eye. My brother says there was a woman squatting in front of a downstairs window, close to where he had just left from. She was pale, her nose was hooked, and her hair was black and stringy. Again, classic horror movie ghost. He said she had black eyes with visible white dots in the middle, inside out eyes as he called them, as she was smiling. He says it took him a second of shock to realise she was looking right at him. He felt sick, like she could walk right out and get him. The burned rubber when his friends snapped out of it and they screamed at each other all the way down the road about what they saw. He called me right after to explain it, but I was with friends and not really willing to listen. What fucks me up? is that my mom thought he had a psychotic break. He went into his room and cried all night at the Airbnb. She thought something happened with his girlfriend. My brother isn't a crier. I haven't seen him do it since we were little. When we got together and talked about it, his eyes teared up then too. He said he didn't know why, but he knew she wanted to kill him. He drew a picture of her. Let me know if you're interested in seeing it. It's not great, but it still fills me with the deepest foreboding. It took me a while to realise that I saw her too, just once in my bedroom almost five years ago. Seeing her suddenly made sense. I knew it didn't feel like a woman, but it felt feminine. It felt like something pretending to be a woman. Anyways, I know this is long. Feel free to offer your opinion. My ex brought this up today, 
We dated all through high school and had a few experiences together that she recounts as her only paranormal encounters. I'd love to still think that this was my own delusion, but it was shared by too many people to be. Maybe a few things are explainable, but most of it isn't. It's affected me so deeply, I'm still terrified that if I think too much about her, she'll follow us a state away. I also forgot to mention we heard word from neighbours that the previous family had 12 people, Mormons, living in a house we could only fit six into. They were really weird according to multiple families and they moved in with five kids and left with four. We heard a toddler drowned in the upstairs bathtub. No idea which one or if this is true. We couldn't find any documentation. To start off with, I've always been a sensitive person, to the point that I'm highly susceptible to migraines, sun sickness and car sickness. Not only are my regular senses heightened, but I could be headed to have six senses. I always say that this is a family thing, but I can't actually remember who told me that, when or why. That said, I've always been able to kind of feel people's energy in the form of emotions, and had a bit of an awareness of electromagnetic energy, able to tell when a CRT TV was on anywhere in a house, but most relevant to this, I've always been sensitive to the supernatural. I also usually don't dream, though dreaming has become more common in adulthood, but I attribute that to less consistent sleep, as I must often dream only if I fall back asleep after waking up. As a kid, I remember I was afraid of the dark because I always felt like I saw things in it. But that was very likely my imagination, as I remember that I didn't have a strong ability to differentiate my imagination from reality until I was about eight. I remember around 12 I had an out of body experience, but that wasn't really ghostly. Around 14 or 15, I had a very active autumn. On Halloween, I saw three shadow people in one night, one watching me from a fence, one behind an above ground pool while playing hide and seek. And I can't remember the third, but I remember there were three. This all happened at my father's best friend's house during a Halloween party. And I remember people saying I must have seen someone in costume. But the more you think about it, the dumber that sounds because shadow people really just don't look like people in costume. A week or two later in November, I was out late in an appointment with my mother and we were walking back to the car. The building had lights on the sides and I was trailing a few feet behind my mother. It was a short walk, but at one point, I just looked down at my shadow and noticed the second one next to mine, almost twice as long and maybe a foot wider. I looked over my left shoulder to see where it was coming from, but as I did, I heard a rustling in the bushes about five feet to my right. Turning around, I didn't see anything there or in the bushes, and the shadow was gone. I freaked out and ran with my mom to the car. I can't remember clearly if I definitely saw shadow people any time in the future after that, but I think I did. The next major things I experienced, though, were my Uncle Frank. He was a very well-respected man, and not just my godfather, but felt like the godfather, with the way he was treated and the way he carried himself. He had a position high up in American Airlines, and he passed away in 2012. I remember being told that the plane carrying his body back to New York made two trips around the city before landing. I think he landed at JFK, but I don't know for sure. During this time, though, I was 17 and attending Stony Brook University so I had to get picked up and brought home for the funeral. I only had one pair of dress pants that I brought with me, and before we threw it in the wash, we emptied the pockets. But when I took the pants out of the dryer and stuck my hands in my pockets to open them up, I found a freshly minted $20 bill. I still have it pressed into a book in my pocket. Every time I saw Frank, he'd give me money like that, so finding that 20, I just started crying. Frank is an active spirit, and I know he's done a few other things, but only one other stands out in my memory. This spring, my cousin Gina got engaged to her longtime boyfriend, Rory. Rory knew about Frank, of course, but I don't think they ever met, and he said that after Gina said yes, they had commented, I wish I could have asked your grandfather, Frank, for permission. 
They swore that immediately after they said that, a rainbow appeared out of nowhere. When I spoke to my mum about how I can't remember more Frank stories, she assured me that people like him are always around and said she still feels her father around all the time. I asked her about this because she's never mentioned this to me before and she was surprised she hadn't. So I'll share what she said now. Whenever I'm looking for something in the garage, I usually have trouble. So if I can't find something after a moment, I just say, okay, dad, where is it? And suddenly it would appear. I found this a very interesting story for a few reasons. One, my grandfather died long before we got their current house. So kind of funny he'd know where anything in that garage is. And two, my mom has always had a talent for finding things no one else can. And I've joked about her being able to find anything for years. I wonder if that's just because of her dad. The last thing I have to mention is not really fun at all and I still don't know how to explain it. So me and my fiance moved into our apartment last June and we went to her family's Thanksgiving together for the first time ever that year. So on the way there, we went through a neighborhood I've never seen before. And the second we entered the neighborhood, something was very, very wrong. I'm starting to cry and sweat cold just remembering this, but I can't explain it very well. I was just sitting there and all of a sudden I got a chill. Something was focused on me, a very strange presence. I couldn't say where or what that something was in that neighborhood. It took us about seven minutes to get from one side to the other. My fiance was terrified, not because she felt anything, but because I was crying, a horrified mess, complaining to her about something watching me. Something felt like it was out to get me. I'd never been so scared in my life. We went to my parents after we left her family's house, so we've never gone back to that neighborhood. And I wasn't paying attention to where we were going, so I'm not sure where it was. But I don't want to ever go back there again. It's a really hard thing to explain. That sudden sensation of not being watched, but almost haunted. I'd never felt anything like it before, and I never want to feel it again. I never saw anything. It was about three o'clock, so not even dark out, and it seemed like a normal neighborhood, but I swear on my life that something was there, and it felt like it was out to get me for the entire time we were there. So I live in the tropics of Australia. My house is situated in a remote part of the Daintree Rainforest. I live in a house that sits on stilts, I'm a Queenslander. And from my bedroom window, it's about a three to four meter drop. My closest neighborhood is about one kilometer away, or 0.62 miles. I don't live on a main road. However, I'm close to a creek. There is literally no one near me. This only happened around two nights ago. I was alone in my house, except for my cockatiel. I was sitting in bed watching some TV, nothing out of the usual. I then got that all too familiar feeling of someone watching me or something's about to happen. A feeling that I've gotten accustomed to over the past 20 years. At that point, I heard the tap running in the kitchen, which I thought was strange. So I got up, went to the kitchen with my phone's torch as my only guidance. I didn't want to wake my bird by turning the lights on. I've gotten used to these type of things happening and I'm not really all that scared of them anymore. However, as I turned off the tap, my wall clock did its Westminster chime. I looked over and the time showed 12.38 a.m. This straightaway caught my attention as I only set the clock to chime every hour. Then, as I was near the clock, the tap turned back on full force. I jolted, quickly looking in its direction. I went to turn it off. There was condensation all over the handle and all over the window that sits above the tap. The tap was freezing cold, even though the water coming out was boiling hot. My bird at this point was now awake, due to my clock as it was, had just chimed a second time, roughly 12.44. I quickly got my bird and brought him back into my bedroom with me. I left the kitchen and the clock, so I just couldn't be bothered to put up with what was going on. My poor bird was scared shitless. I kind of admit I was too. As I sat in my bed, there were three knocks on my bedroom door. When I ignored them, they moved to my window. I got up and opened my curtains to nothing but trees and the black as ink sky. I opened up the window and my God, I'm getting goosebumps writing this. 
I heard whispers at the bottom of the ground, far below me. I couldn't understand what they were saying. Then they stopped. As soon as they stopped, three knocks yet again hit my door. I slammed my door shut and locked the door. I yelled out, Can you please just leave me in peace? They stopped. Nothing else happened that night and I finally got some sleep. It was really creepy, not too scary, but scary enough to give me some trouble sleeping. It was one of the last weeks of Christmas holidays in Oz and my family was getting ready to move out of our Queenslander. The experience happened within a week, the last two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. I had two mates over for a sleepover. The first day of this experience, previous Friday, my grandfather was looking after me. The house was a general layout. There's a long hallway, four bedrooms and two bathrooms that branch off from said hallway. At the bottom of the hallway there's the kitchen, lounge room and dining area. There's a second small hallway leading from the kitchen out to the back deck. This back deck sits far higher up than the backyard, like a giant balcony looking over the backyard. It's worth mentioning that a spare bedroom branches off from the top of the main hallway. This is where the latter of the story is. I should also mention that I had a fascination for electronics. I still do. So I had electronic train sets, and I also had a security system, only three security cameras, because I liked playing around with the switchboard. Friday. My mum and dad had left early for work, so I woke up to the smell of crispy bacon and egg breakfast sandwiches. My grandfather always believes that breakfast is the most important meal and never settles for anything that doesn't have sausages, eggs, or some sort of breakfast sandwich. I slowly stumbled into the kitchen, still half asleep, gazing upon my steaming hot meal on the table. Well, are you going to sit down and eat? It isn't going to eat itself. For my grandfather's query, I sat down and ate. So did he. We had a bit of a discussion. He said that we would go to the corner shop in the afternoon, but he wanted to watch the midday races, which was code word for he wanted to sleep for three hours after lunch. After breakfast, I played with some Lego and played with my dog, etc. Nothing really happens until after lunch and my grandfather is asleep. So let's skip to then. With my grandfather snoring loudly and reclined in his chair and I bored with races, I decided to go down into the backyard and say hello to the cockatoos. My neighbours at the time had a pair of sulphur-crested cockatoos. Their cage was outside, down in the middle of the neighbour boundaries, but we didn't mind. I walked down to the cage that sat under two huge avocado trees. Hello, Bluey. Hello, Bluey. The pair knew my name. As I visited them often, they were honestly quite cute. I sat on my little wooden stool I had there and just admired them for five or ten minutes, as well as listening to the magpies flying high above. Then I got that feeling, the feeling of someone watching, that feeling that something is going to happen. Out of instincts, I look behind me and up towards the deck, just barely being able to see the back door due to perspective. After seeing nothing there, I turn back around to the cockatoos. This is when things become hectic. Only 10 seconds after I turned back around, the crests upon both cockatoos rose simultaneously to their full length. They flattened their body feathers and stood up straight. Cockatoos and cockatiels do this behavior when they're mostly curious, shocked, surprised or worried. They started to absolutely scream. They started to shout my name, their owner's name, and also started to native scream. I was now in shock. I didn't want to turn around, I was frozen until I felt an icy cold breath on the back of my neck. I instantly turned around from feeling this. I see nothing. While looking behind me, the front leg of my stool just snapped. I fell forward, face planting into the ground. At this point, the cockatoos have started to fly around in their cage. I stand up quickly, frozen again. Then, in the side of my hair, I hear bluey. It was quiet and sounded like an old, angry man. I felt his breath touch the outside of my ear. I started to sprint. I got no more than a meter when I slipped and fell down onto the ground from a fallen, rotten avocado. I tried to get up, but of course, I badly rolled my ankle. As I tried to stand up, I heard a scream, and I mean a full-on scream, 
burst into my left ear. Bluey, run! Yet again, it sounded like the same old creepy man. I was stumbling, almost hopping towards the stairs to get up onto the deck. I was probably going a little faster than walking speed. After reaching the top of the deck, I made the last hobble towards the back door. It was locked. I started to absolutely scream for my grandfather. I was banging at the door, just yelling as loud as I humanly could. I saw my granddad through the large glass pane rushing towards the door. He pushed it open, but it slammed back into his face, causing the glass pane to shatter into huge shards. Then it stopped and let the door open. Nothing really happened after that. However, my granddad thought it would be best if we spent the rest of the day in his house. Tuesday to Wednesday. I was still in shock from Friday, but today was the day that two of my good friends came for a sleepover as I was moving cities. Lucas and James arrived around one o'clock. We did the usual things, played in the backyard, hung out in the small wooden tree house that my dad built us. It sat about halfway up on one of the many avocado trees we had in the backyard. I did get that creepy feeling that I got on Friday and I wasn't totally comfortable playing around in the yard. But I had my friends there, so I thought it was okay. It was around six o'clock when my dad told us to come inside for dinner and to bring Fletcher inside. Fletcher is my dog. We always bring him inside of a night. We went and fetched Fletcher. He was sniffing around some dirt holes, as lots of schnauzers do. We came into the kitchen and sat down for nachos. We decided to watch a couple of movies, play some Wii, and then go to sleep in the spare bedroom. It was probably 11 o'clock. My parents were in bed and fast asleep. The three of us had just finished watching our third movie and decided we should probably head off to bed too. We shambled up the long, narrow hallway with Fletcher guiding us. We finally reached the spare bedroom. Inside sat a TV, my switchboard for the cameras, a queen and a single bed. The three of us sat on the queen bed as James wanted to have a look outside. So I turned on the TV and the camera system set up. I switched to channel one, the front camera. They had night vision, but as you can imagine, this was around 10 years ago, so it wasn't the best night vision around. But it wasn't very clear. I continued to switch to the second camera, channel two. It pointed towards the driveway, then to the third, which looked down into the backyard. James thought it was awesome, Lucas wanted to sleep and at this point, I was so tired that I really couldn't care less. James took control and switched through the channels, thinking he was some sort of security guard. Then, some static took a hold of channel two. Bluey, what was that? Bluey? It was just a bit of static. It happens sometimes for James. Fletcher at this point went next to Lucas, the both of them pretty much asleep on the queen's bed. I was in the single, making sure James didn't stuff up the setup on my desk. It was at this point where I got that feeling again. I desperately wanted to turn on the bedroom lights, but I didn't want to seem like a wuss. So instead, I leaned in closer, now watching each cam very carefully along with James. Fletcher, what are you doing? I'm trying to sleep. I turned around to see Lucas disgruntled and Fletcher no longer sleeping, but instead standing up on the bed. His ears were pricked up. He was slightly leaning forward, putting pressure on his front legs. Again, this is a common defense and or attack stance for a schnauzer. He started to growl. I was not fully alarmed. So was Lucas and James. Static had not taken over the camera system. Lucas put a chair up against the doorknob. James, get up and shut the blinds. James scrambled up from the office chair. Lucas grabbed one of the two chairs at my desk and quickly put it against the door. I sat down and rebooted the system, in quite a panic if I may add. After rebooting, there was no longer any static. I quickly put it onto channel three to look at the backyard. Sure enough, I could barely see the cockatoos flying and going wild in their cages. I muttered, oh no. Me saying this absolutely freaked the hell out of James and Lucas. They turned to a puddle of mush. Well, what's wrong, Bluey? Well, I'm pretty sure we're going to find out soon enough. Static no longer filled the camera system. No. Instead, the lenses started to fog up. I could no longer see out of channel 3, 
Quick, quick, go to channel one. There's no point, James. They have all condensation on them. At this point, Lucas was very quiet until he said, Guys, someone just poked me. Lucas was on the queen bed. James was on the single. And I was sitting in the office chair. James and I went into the queen with Lucas. The three of us sat huddled. We grabbed Fletcher, still growling towards the door. The three of us watched the camera. We would see faint shadows moving around. I went to turn on the bedroom light. You guessed it, it wouldn't turn on. Then the camera went to static. I changed the channels, nothing, all was static. I rebooted it twice, nothing. Then a cackle was heard. I jumped back into the bed. The cackle went again. At this point, James was on the brink of tears. I felt another breath on the back of my neck. It sent spine tingling shivers throughout my body. Lucas peeked through the blinds. The window had conversation all over it, but that wasn't the problem. Lucas mumbled, oh my God. Written on the outside of the window was end. That window has nothing beneath it, except the ground, which was three or four meters below. Lucas quickly crawled back from the window, back to the middle of the room. Fletcher stopped growling, but now instead was whimpering. Just as he started to whimper, we heard a single tap at the window. Then nothing. Fletcher quickly looked towards the door, and sure enough, we heard footsteps, slowly coming closer from the hallway. Then the footsteps stopped, right in front of the door. Silence for 10 seconds. Fletcher began to absolutely cry and for good reason. Three loud knocks were hit with a large amount of force on the door, then again silence. Until rapid tapping on the window took place, a rock then got thrown at the window, smashing it. We started to absolutely scream, moving the chair, trying to pull open the door. Then the same voice screamed in the room, you're wanting to leave so early, I'm that bad of a host. The door flung open, an inertia effect happened and we all fell flat onto the ground. We got up and ran screaming down the hallway. We bolted past a mirror that shattered as we went past it. My parents were now awake and as soon as they stepped outside of their room, it all stopped. James and Lucas went home early and thankfully we moved out of that house three days later. However, the next morning we saw the true aftermath. All three cameras had been ripped out. Only thing left were wires coming from the roof. We never found the cameras. The window had somehow been smashed and the two meter long mirror was in ruins. I never really found out who the spirit was, but he was definitely aggressive. The house wasn't too old. I think it was built in the 1940s from what I can remember. Both experiences were terrifying and I've never owned security cameras again due to the fear of what I may see on them. This story happened many years ago, around the months of July and June. My family and I often vacationed up at a cabin in Yungambura, Cairns, Australia, during winter. We do this as we miss the cold days we would get from our hometown of Toowoomba during winter, as Cairns is tropical, so it's summer 24-7. Yungambura is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that, if you blink, you miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical, with about 150 plus years of heritage. As usually with rich heritage in small towns, local folk legends form over the years. One of these legends came true. We rented this cabin that was on the brink of bushlands and was next to an old farmhouse that has quite a bit of land, including some of the bushland the cabin backed onto. To get to the cabin, you had to walk up to a somewhat steep dirt road that also lead to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium sized pond that ran along it. The dirt road came off one of the main streets of Yungabora. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungabora. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He on the other hand, didn't have to drive anywhere the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. It got to about 11.30 p.m and I decided I'd better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15 minute walk. So after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized not driving was a dumb idea. 
as it was about 5 degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper and that was all. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder. I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway. God, did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was up. After I had my flashlight on, fog started to roll in. At first, it was only light fog, but it continued and developed into heavy fog. Then it surpassed heavy fog. Thereupon, I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, here we fucking go. Something's about to happen. Get it over and done with. On recollection, I believe I actually said that out loud. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom. The last thing I wanted was to fall in it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance, a small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard, son, is that you? Come here out of the fog, follow the lamp. It was my mum. I couldn't yet see her, so instead I followed her light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up steps and I heard a door open, so I knew I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction I saw it last. I was calling out to my mum to turn it back on. There was no reply. Until I finally ran into a wooden guardrail on some steps. I walked up the steps and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swaying upon in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There's three things you do in this type of situation. The three Fs. Flight, fight, freeze. I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mum's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then I realised I would rather be out in the fog than standing on the doorsteps of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs. I heard the voice now yelling, my son, where are you going? I started to sprint. But as I was running, I smashed my foot and leg against some sort of stone and fell flat onto the ground. I took a chunk out of my knee and cuts all along my hands. I still have the scars. I turned around and realized I hadn't tripped over a stone. I tripped over a tombstone. At this point, I screamed. I got up and started to run even more. I was screaming out for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped. I thought I got far enough from the house until little amber lights, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and ran for it. Yet again, I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the medal at the end was my life. Before I knew it, slam! I ran straight into a wall, with my head being the contact point. I blacked out, and from what I can remember, I was woken up by my dad who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently, when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night and any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me time to rest. This also gave me time to ring up my friend so he could come over and perhaps give me some insight into what I saw and what my dad saw. Me and him sat out on the patio I could see the farmhouse only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first built late 19th century. During the 1910s, a well-known mother, Anne, her apparent name was, let her son play with some of his mates down on the main stretch of town one day. It started to get late. As it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go looking for him. As she walked down, she could hear his footsteps. She told him to follow the lamp. When she made her way back to the house, she wasn't accompanied by her son. 
It was not until the next morning they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently her son's. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late cold darkness, mistaking them for her own son. This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late twenties and so is my friend. It was around June in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets its coldest in Toowoomba and that night I remember it reaching minus four degrees Celsius or 25 Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark's a teacher there and apparently his car had stopped working. I wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block. I finally reached the block and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what happened. He said in his shaky voice, he's here, a ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak it. Downlands is a boarding school, so I know there was a small amount of people still here. However, the boarding block and admin block is a far, far ways apart. And I wasn't about to wander through the dark pathways with Mark spouting the stuff he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up the office and cautiously walked out. As we were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers, the wind was making an eerie howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light, an orange light, coming from behind us. All of a sudden, it got really warm, and I mean a quick, sudden boost in temperature. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see who was at the top of the hill. This still freaks me out when I think of it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us. When we turned around, he stared at us for about five seconds. It felt like five hours then. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over to the side of the path. The man on fire ran past us, down the hill and into the forest. I got up. I looked down toward the oval. He was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running towards a road until him and the fire vanished. At that point, we decided to run to the boarding block and find another member of faculty. We reached the block. We found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told, it's a common thing to see if you stay in the admin block too late or if you're walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, everyone can hear his screams at least once a week as he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. Apparently, the faculty member, who was also a teacher, said he had only seen the burning man once. When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, he replied with, all the drawers started to open and I heard a voice say, the fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they had ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her 30s. She asked, do you have an appointment, Mark? No, but we just wanted to ask if you had ever seen... Then an older lady, maybe late 60s, early 70s, came back out from the back and said, you two saw the burning man, didn't you? Mark replied, yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came close and said, yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many a times. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late. If you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left. Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. The Burning Man at Downlands College has been noted as one of Toowoomba's most minacious paranormal experiences. In my late 20s and last month, I had one of the most scariest experiences I've ever had. My family attracts spirits. As in the 18th century, some of my family dabbled in some of the spirit stuff. They got blamed as witches and they got burned at the stake. That's a story for another day. Anyway, 
I was on a four-wheel drive adventure with my dad, mum and my dog. We have a buffed up Pajero. Not the best four-wheel drive, but it still makes it across desert tracks. It was on the 12th of December, I believe. We were crossing a track in the Northern Territory, Australia. We had just finished crossing a rocky portion of the track and was now on flat dirt road. We started to set up camp for the night. As I stepped out of the car, I went around the back to the water containers to fetch some water for my dog. But as I walked near them, I heard a trickling and gushing noise. Sure enough, a rock had punctured both external water containers. I quickly went and told dad we had barely enough internal water to last us a day. So we made the decision to drive at night. You should only really drive at night if you most definitely have to. Otherwise, you should generally avoid it. We knew there was a small community just outside of Yundumu, around 45 minutes away. It was already 7.15 and pitch black. We got in the car and started to drive. This road was particularly dangerous as it was long and straight. People often fell asleep and drove off the road doing 110 kilometers an hour. We were about halfway there. I was sitting in the back with my standard schnauzer on my lap. He was drifting asleep until his ears pricked up. He then jumped up. It looked like he was trying to look behind us. I turned around and saw nothing but a black, empty, eerie desert. I turned back to the front to see my mum drifting to sleep and my dad wide awake. Then all of a sudden, my dog started to whine really loud. A really bright light was reflecting in the side mirrors and rear view mirror. My dad said, what, is that a car behind us? I looked behind us. There were two extremely bright lights tailgating our car. At this point, my dog was barking and whining. My mum had woken up and immediately started to panic. The lights continued to tailgate us for the next two minutes. We then passed a tree and all of a sudden the lights had stopped. The car was no longer behind us, it had disappeared. My dad stopped the car, he turned it around thinking the car may have crashed. We got near the tree, I got up on the roof, turned on the giant spotlights we had fitted for this trip and shone it all around us searching for the car. There was no sight of it, just empty red dirt. We searched for another 15 minutes, even on foot, nothing. So we continued on with the drive, hoping to find some help in the coming community. Once we reached the small settlement just outside of Yuendumu, we raced into the pub. The pub was ext empty except for the bartender. He immediately asked us, what's wrong, something up? My dad replied with, we were just driving along the track. We saw a car disappear off the road. Someone could be hurt. The bartender put down his rag and said, you guys saw the Northern Nissan. No one's hurt, at least not now. I replied in a somewhat impatient tone, what do you mean? Someone could be hurt. He then pointed to a news article up on the wood wall. It read, Nissan crashes into tree, killing all two on board. What you saw was the ghost of the Northern Nissan. It crashed about a bit more than a decade ago. It was two brothers quickly making their way into town as one of the brothers was sick. They crashed into that tree at about half past seven. Many people who make that road at night see them at around the time you guys saw them. My mum's mouth had dropped. My dad sat down. We stayed in that small settlement for the night. In the morning, we decided to go look at the tree. What we saw was a scar from a crash and exactly where we saw the car disappear the night before. It was creepy to think. I got out on foot searching for a ghost car seconds after it had disappeared. My family had seen the Northern Nissan. This was around five or six years ago. I would say I was a skeptic, but not adverse to the idea of ghosts. I worked in a nursery, kids, not plants, and the building itself used to be a hospital for tuberculosis. The baby side of the nursery was in the old morgue for the hospital, not my side. I'd never heard anything in that building in the nursery, but numerous girls, staff, had said they had seen a woman walking around the baby's nap room in the old morgue. But when they ran in, it was empty. It had a video monitor, so they would see her on the black and white screen. The older kids were in the old hospital. Anyway, I had covered many times in the old morgue and had worked in the old hospital side for three years without any incidents or hearing of any incidents. One night though, when I had moved to the office, 
not working with the kids anymore. I had a few things to finish up when the nursery was closing, so I spoke to the manager and got their keys so I could close. The owner lived in a house right behind the nursery, and there were houses all around. Also, again, I'd worked there three years and was often the person, first person to arrive in the morning. So when I decided to close, I wasn't worried. It was also Scotland in the summer, so even though it was six at night, it was very bright outside. It was about 6.30 when I finished what I was doing. I was in no rush and was in a great mood because I had managed to finish something so important. So I was kind of swanning around the building. As the last one out, I had to check every room to make sure there were no kids or fire hazards. And as I was checking a room at the back with glass, Perpix walkway looking into the entrance, I saw a tall man dressed in dark clothes walking in the front door. I ran to the entrance to tell them all the kids were gone already and to check the other building, but no one was there. Very strange, but I figured I must have imagined it because I was looking from the other side of the building. So I cracked on with checking the rooms. I got to the next room and I had a panicked feeling telling me to get out, run as fast as I could and not look back. I have anxiety, but I've never experienced anything like it. It was like a serial killer was chasing you. As soon as I got outside the door, I felt a wave of calm over me. I locked the door and cycled away. I actually met one of my colleagues just driving away. That's how quick I'd been. Anyway, the next morning I told the manager and basically said I wouldn't close again and I wouldn't want anyone else doing it on their own. That's when the girl who'd been doing it for months said that she had seen the figure, the same as I'd seen, every night, either at the door or preschool, and she always felt that it meant her harm. She needed the pay increase with closing and she was very level-headed, like me. We actually worked in the same room and got on for that reason. I didn't want to think about it too much. But she did what she had to do, then got out of there ASAP. During the day, we had no problems at all. So we thought that maybe the entity was fine with day-to-day -day business. But once it was done, they wanted us out of there. Either way, that feeling and the clearness with which I saw that man has made me seriously rethink ghosts. I'm not even sure if that's what it was, but honestly, that feeling was unlike anything I've ever felt before or since. Pure hatred in your heart. It was back in 2008-9. My great-grandmother, GGM, passed away. Fortunately, I had the chance to see her one last time, the week before she died, and they told me that she left us with a smile. With that... I knew that seeing me was really delightful for her. So it was early in the morning, getting ready to go to the nurse before going to school with my little sister. We're both sitting at the back of the car, still a little sleepy. While I was looking outside the window, I saw a humanoid figure forming. I immediately recognized this face. It was my late GGM, wearing the same flowery purple blouse I've always seen her with, both hands on her stomach, looking at me and saying something. Today, I still don't know what she wanted to tell me. When it happened, I thought I was the only one who saw this. I told my mother about this the next day. She almost told me I was kind of crazy until my sister also told me she had seen the apparition. I was kind of disturbed by hearing that. That was thrilling and frightful at the same time. The only person who believed us without saying we were crazy was our grandmother, actually the GGM's daughter, because she was also seeing her in her dreams in her prayers, and she kept talking to her for maybe five years or more until one night, my GGM didn't visit my grandmother. More recently, this didn't happen to me, but my sister last year. She was sleeping at one of her friend's places and she had a sleep paralysis. Not really sleep paralysis, it was really strange. And during that, she was wide awake. She could walk and all but not talk. Trying to wake up one of her friends, she scratched him and she also saw our GGM saying something to her, but still, we don't know what. From a cloaked man in a hood without a face, to someone with an affinity for a certain room, as well as several other sightings in between, the Holy Family Parish Church in Maine is haunted with a lot of activities. The Stillwater Montessori School 
rented out two rooms and utilized a good part of the building for their interests. From 1990 to 1997, I went to this school. Its layout was fairly simple. The door the school used were the ones closest to the road. It opened up to a long hallway immediately in front and the hallway to the right. This right hallway was where the school resided. This shorter hallway on the right side had a classroom that we used as a dining room, then two classrooms, Terry's and Owl's. Past those three rooms was a large open coat closet. Around the corner along the adjacent wall was a large kitchen with a few tables. On the left side, a catering hall across Terry's classroom and bathroom across the coat closet. The kitchen. In the large kitchen, something lurked. This room, us students weren't allowed to play in and we used it only periodically if the church needed our normal dining hall for an event. I saw it lurking throughout the day. I always saw whatever this was through the half length window of the closed door. It looked like a man with head with long dark hair. Every time I saw him, he walked past the door. I never saw a face. Being a curious, somewhat mischievous kid, I had to check to see who else was misbehaving. Often the door would be locked. I peeked through the window and see no one inside the room. When the door was unlocked, I stepped inside. I wouldn't be greeted by anyone. The room was all, always empty. Well, it always looked empty. It didn't feel empty and it didn't sound empty. There was an authoritative energy in the room. It was strict and cold. I was a little nervous that if I stayed there for more than a minute, I'd get a good beating. The minimal moments I poked my whole body in the room, I could faintly hear dishes rattling by the sink and general mixing and cooking sounds. Sometimes we'd have to eat lunch in this room because our normal dining room was occupied. I was the only student not excited to eat my lunch here. Upon finding out we'd be guests in this room, I'd dread it and lose my appetite. I wasn't the only one eating there, so that made it a little bit better. I still didn't feel welcome. I'd constantly hear extra noises that didn't match students who were eating packed lunches. It was unsettling. I was always glad lunch was over when in this room. The reception hall. The school used the catering hall for potlucks throughout the year. The potlucks would include a theatre show put on by the students. The energy in this hall was somewhat ominous. Due to the kitchen and bathrooms jutting out from an otherwise large rectangular room, there were three sections of this room. The open area in front of the bathrooms, the large area overlooking the kitchen, and the smaller area that faced the entrance. This smaller area had a dark corner where the panelling was different. It looked like a booth or nook that maybe a cash register might be placed. Behind the counter, there was a weird room and closet that didn't feel right. Other than this section, light brown panelling, a suspended ceiling and white grey speckled vinyl adorned the room. In the centre of the longest back wall hung a large crucifix between two large windows. There were two potlucks a year. Rehearsals took place in the hall on a makeshift stage between the two windows. This is where all shows were performed. I always felt an audience of two extra people watching us. In the height of this feeling, Whenever I'd look over by the kitchen wall directly across from where I was standing, I'd see a faint shadow of a man in a top hat. The man wasn't letting off a whole lot of emotions. He was just there like an overseer, sending wide bits of compassion in a slightly ominous way. Meanwhile, over by the darker panelling, an angry energy lingered behind the shadows, invisible to the eye, but I could feel it. Sorrowful anger, looming, as long as I stood clear of this dark area and never ventured there alone, I knew I was safe. Midnight Mass at Christmas. Growing up, it was a tradition to go to Midnight Mass on Christmas. My Aunt Claire, my brother Josh and I would nap in the evening and got up at 11 and head to Mass. Often the church that would host the Mass was the Holy Family Parish Church. One Christmas, while I was in high school, probably 2003, we arrived at the church and entered the church by way of the main entrance, overlooking the road. The three of us walked down the alley to sit in the pew we wanted, towards the middle of the floor. We sat down. As the mass went on, eventually I caught a glimpse of a man on the stage. Anger and confusion, 
added to the overwhelming, gracious, gracious, peaceful Christmas atmosphere. He was wearing black cloak. The hood was over his invisible head. It just stood there for a few seconds before it just turned around and disappeared behind a red curtain. Even though this hooded figure scared me, I never mentioned it to anyone. I knew it wouldn't be able to hurt me. Usually, all Catholic churches have some energy. None of the energy is anything like what looms here. 